Hello everyone. It's good to see you again this week. It's from Elisha's home here on Freedom Mountain. So good to see you again. It's good to be with you. And we're so glad that you can join us this evening. Uh, it was a little warmer today and uh, hopefully the snow will melt just a little bit, right? And spring will come soon, hopefully. We've had an awful lot of snow this winter compared to some other winters recently, but hopefully spring is on its way. So if you have your Bibles this evening, I'm just going to ask you to um, open up to 2 Samuel. We're going to start in chapter 13 this evening. And I uh, just want to take a moment to, again, remind you that you want to make sure you have a notebook and a pen to take some notes so that you have um, an opportunity to take some notes to study this week. And... Uh, just want to encourage you to find a comfy spot and settle in, get comfortable, and we'll get started in just a moment. So just want to say that uh, for those of you that have called in with a prayer request, uh, we continue to pray for you. Uh, we do not publicly typically pray here on the internet just for confidentiality reasons. But we haven't forgotten you. Uh, we continue to pray unceasingly for you. And um, just want you to know that, that we're with you in prayer and spirit. And so this is um, the eighth week of our series, Discipleship to Restoration. Last week, we talked a little bit about restoration and all of the things that come from restoration, we talked about how when we have lack, restoration brings abundance and the land is restored and there's no more drought and uh, plenty of water brings an abundant crop. We talked about how the sick and the diseased are healed and that the scriptures say that all are healed. Uh, we talked about uh, how God protects us and how he guides us on the highway of holiness to our journey to heaven through life and so this week we're going to be taking a look as I said in 2nd Samuel chapter 13 and we're going to talk about um, a very delicate topic so I'm going to give a disclaimer before we pray and then I'm going to give the disclaimer again just to make sure if you're a mama or a grandma a daddy or a grandpa and you have a little one nearby this evening's Bible lesson uh, touches on a very mature topic and so uh, I just want to warn you so that if there are little ears you might want to find uh, another room that they can play or that they can be watched or safe so that we don't uh, harm their innocence okay so that's my, my little disclaimer. Make sure that you heard me now. This is a mature topic that we're going to talk about this evening. And so we just want to make sure that we keep our children safe. All right, so let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can set aside to join together as a body of believers. Uh, that we can gather around your word, Heavenly Father, that we can renew our minds and that we can be challenged, Heavenly Father, to think outside the box and to be quiet and still before you so that our spiritual eyes can see and that our spiritual ears can hear and so that our spirit might be receptive for the message that you have this evening. I ask, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit would come and uh, would join us. We uh, dedicate this time uh, to learning your word and then to learn and then to apply your word. And so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message that you have this evening. And uh, we consecrate this time uh, to fully honor and to glorify you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 
So we're looking this evening at 2 Samuel. We're going to start off uh, in chapter 13. And we're going to be looking at uh, King David's children. And uh, many of us know the history of King David. We know that he had a little bit of a bumpy road uh, in his journey before he became the king. And uh, we know that he battled uh, with the force of lust in his life. Uh, we know that he had a, a difficult childhood. And uh, when he came into, he was coming into his kingship, there was a difficult time where his life was threatened. And so that was traumatic also. We know that while he was king, uh, he had several concubines. And we also know that he had several wives. And so he has children um, to each of those wives. So when this occurs, we have a interesting scenario as far as families. So we have uh, half siblings. And so that makes it interesting where they have the same daddy, but they have a different mama. So uh, we know that at one time it appears that he possibly had up to 10 wives. And as I said, he had numerous concubines. And then we remember them that his son Solomon, he had the same issue. And we're not going to talk about Solomon this evening, but we're going to talk about uh, Amnon, the eldest of his sons. And we're also going to talk about Absalom. Okay, so we're going to take a look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1 and 2 to begin with. And before we begin, I just want to kind of get us in the mindset for what we're going to be talking about. You know, when you are uh, walking through life, there will be times that if you're not renewing your mind, um, your heart could have... Uh, I'm trying to think of the word. Your heart could have uh, a notion that it thinks that it needs something uh, that might not be of God. And so because you are obsessed with that and that your mind is not renewed, you will not see with spiritual eyes and you will not hear with spiritual ears. And so you will convince yourself that the sin that you are about to commit, you will come up with all of these excuses as to why it's okay for you to do this. And so I just want to say this to you as a heed of warning that oftentimes when there's something that we want to do, we technically we know in the back of our mind that it's evil and that it's not of God and yet we press on and so you know oftentimes when we come into a situation like that instead of going to God and laying it before God we'll get on the phone and we'll call person number one and when person number one says nope that's not a God we go to person number two and when person number two says, nope, that's not a God, we go to person three. And when person three says, nope, that's not a God, we just keep going down the line till we finally find some poor dear soul that will agree with us. And once we've got that agreement, then we tell ourselves, okay, it's okay to go do that. We justify. So let me just say this to you. When you do that, you set yourself up to absorb the bad advice and then to act on that bad advice and then you set yourself up for a chain of events in your life where you cross out the blessing of God because now you have veered off the path and now you're going to get lost down the way and hopefully somebody comes across your path and shines the light for you to see that you are off and narrow and hopefully there'll be somebody that can help to convince you and help to guide you back onto the straight and narrow right so how many of us at some point somewhere in our life had something that we wanted to do and we knew we knew it was wrong but we looked 
And we found and we searched till we found that one person that was stupid enough to give us ill advice. And then we acted on it. And then there was a whole bunch of things then that started to go awry, awry in, our, in our life. And then what's the question that we ask? Why? Right? Do we really have to ask why? Not usually. Usually we know why. We know why. We're just trying to convince ourselves that just maybe we'll come up with a reason so we can convince everybody else what we did was not evil. So this evening we're going to see uh, a scenario where this actually happens. Taking a look now at Second Samuel chapter 13 verse 1 and 2, uh, we see uh, Amnon is David's eldest son and we see that he has an infatuation with Tamar, his half-sister. Right? Meaning that David is the daddy of both. After this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick. For she was a virgin, and it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. So, as I said, they are half siblings, and this is, Amnon is David's oldest son, and so he would be the first in line for the throne of Israel. And so, you can check this out to verify who his mother is. Um, she's a Jezreelite, and you can check this out in Second Samuel chapter three, verse two to uh, verify his mama. Now, Tamar is a half-sister of Amnon. Like we said, same daddy, different mama. And she is the daughter of, uh, she is the daughter of Makah, David's wife, who was the daughter of the king of Jesher. And you can see that in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 3. All right. So keep that in mind because later in this story, we're going to see Absalom is going to flee to his kingly grandpa of the country of Jesher. All right. So not only do we have half siblings in this scenario, we have some political things that we're going to see pop up in this arena. So we see that Amnon says that he loved her. So we know that he didn't really love her. He lusted after her. He mentions that she was a virgin. And so that was enticing to him because she was still available for marriage. Now we know in the scriptures that marriage between a half-brother and a half-sister is forbidden. Absolutely forbidden. In 2 Samuel verses 3-5 through 5, we see Jonadab's evil advice. Alright, let's take a look. But Amnon had a friend. Don't we all have a friend that would just love to give us some evil advice? But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah. David's brother. Now, notice that he's a son of David's brother. So that tells us that Shemaiah, the son of Shemaiah, he is, Jonadab, is the cousin, the cousin of Amnon. Now, Jonadab was a very crafty man, and he said to him, why are you, the king's son, becoming thinner day after day? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. So Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and give me food and prepare the food in my sight that I might see it and eat it from her hand. Now, notice that he says, I love Tamar, 
my brother Absalom's sister. Now, is she Absalom's sister? Yes, she is. Is she his sister? Yes, she is. She's a half-sister. So, he's denying sisterhood, siblinghood, between the two of them, himself and Tamar, to convince himself that this is A-OK. -okay. It's not A-OK, -okay, right? So we see that Jonadab the cousin, he was a crafty man, and so he gave wicked advice to Amnon. And so Amnon jumped on this wicked advice because he was told it was okay to do, to get what he wanted. And so we begin to see now a disastrous chain that happens in his life. It happens to Tamar. It affects Absalom, his brother. It affects his daddy. It affects the grandpa clear over in the other country of Jeshur. So you see our sin, you may try to convince yourself that your sin only affects you, but it doesn't. There's a chain of events and it affects many other people. So don't ever try to convince me that your sin only impacts you. It impacts other people's lives that you are entangled with. So notice he says that he loves Tamar. Does he love her? No, he doesn't love her. He lusts after her. And often we see even in modern civilization that love masquerades, I'm sorry, lust masquerades as love, right? And then after, maybe the young person ends up pregnant, and then the young man, off he goes as though he never knew her. How many of us know someone that that happened to? I think we all do. So, remember that deception produces an excuse, and we use that excuse to justify our sin. We use that excuse to justify our sin. So, Jonadab said to him, he said, well, you know, go ahead and arrange a meeting with Tamar. Pretend to be ill, and then he didn't even have to say, go ahead and force yourself. He's just telling him subtly how to set it up, and then the two evil minds didn't even have to speak it. They knew it in their spirits. And so they were thinking the same wicked thoughts. So then in verse 6 to 10, Amnon pretends illness in order with the purpose and the intent to be alone with his half-sister Tamar. Then Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes for me in my sight that I might eat for from her hand. And David sent home to Tamar saying, Now go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house and he was lying down. Then she took flour and kneaded it, made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. And she took the pan, placed them out before him, but he refused to eat. Then Amnon said, Have, every, have everyone go out from me. And they all went out from him, and then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom, that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made, and brought them to Amnon, her brother, in the bedroom. And uh, he is encouraging her, and in her innocence, she's doing as he is asking. And so we notice that Amnon was quick to take Jonadab's advice. Took it, luck, stock, and barrel, used it for his own benefit. And so when David went home, he sent Tamar over to Amnon's residence, told her, go make him some food. And so uh, what Amnon said about being so ill that he couldn't eat, that he needed her to feed him uh, was a lie. It was a total lie. It was a total deception. 
and he was setting it up so that he could um, be alone and force himself on her. And so then we see in 2 Samuel 13, verse 11 to 14, he actually commits the act. Now when she had brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. And she answered him, No, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. And I, where could I take my shame? And as for you... You would be like the one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. However, he would not heed her voice. And being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. So, he's naturally evil. He's trying to convince her. Notice she says, um, Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you so at this point she's trying to devise that you know what if I tell you to go speak to the king and I can convince you to do that that gives me room to get out of here and go lock myself up somewhere and to be able to tell the king what occurred however her plan didn't work and so sadly she was at his mercy so we see in the law of Moses that um, there is there is no ruling where it is acceptable for a half brother and a half sister to be married. You can look this up and study this in Leviticus chapter eighteen, verse eleven. All right, so this definitely was a ploy that she was putting out there, hoping that he'd bite on that, take off, go talk to the king, and that gives her room to run away to safety. And so we see that uh, he's blinded by the spirit of lust. And so we find after he commits the act, he wants nothing to do with her because when he looks at her, she's a reminder of the sin that he's just committed. And now he realizes, yeah, that was a sin after he committed the act. Now, isn't that how Satan works? He takes, he blinds us. Right? And not that we can totally blame it on Satan because if we renew our mind and our spirit is in operation and at the forefront, this won't happen. But if we're not renewing our mind, we are easy prey for Satan to come in, easily convince us that it is acceptable to act like an animal. All right, let's take a look at verse 15. This is where Amnon rejects Tamar. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Arise, be gone. Isn't that just how it is when you commit a sin and you realize that it was wrong? You just want to erase it? And you figure that if you do this act or this act, maybe you can cover it up. And no one will ever know and you won't ever get caught. And so then sometimes you get caught. And when you get caught, if you're honest with yourself, you're only sorry because you got caught. You're not sorry because you have remorse. Because you recognize that it was a sin before God. And you need to come on bended knee and to repent. And so this was... His case. He never loved her. He simply looked at her and her beauty. He was infatuated and was lustful. And so now he wants her out of his sight so that he doesn't have to look at her and be disgusted and be reminded of his sin. So let's just stop for a moment and let's stop and think about his daddy, King David. Now, his daddy, King David, it's recorded in the scriptures that he had a lust issue. And specifically, the story of Bathsheba, right? He saw her over there getting ready to take a bath and invites her over. And she gets pregnant. And then he calls for the guard from the army and has her husband come off of the battlefield, hoping 
that he'll go sleep with his wife only he is an honorable man of the military and feels it's improper and so he never goes and and so then David sends him back puts him on the front lines with the intent that he would be killed so murder was in his heart all right so we've got lust and we've got murder in the headship of this family murder and lust so we have a generational iniquity a sin that's coming down through now remember my favorite little saying what we do as parents in moderation our children will do in excess all right so stop and think with me think about the child that you are the most like or your child that is most like you okay just think for a moment all right so now you have that child now think about the characteristics of that child when you see that child walk in the awesome giftings and talents that you have those generational blessings don't you just get so excited okay now stop and think when that same child can commits a sin that is a replica of your sin don't you just cringe because it's bigger it's bolder and it's out there bigger than when it was with you right so remember this whatever we do as parents in moderation our children will do in excess ouch ouch so this is what we're seeing in David's line. We see murder and we see lust, right? And so now we see it in Amnon. And so now we're going to begin to see a whole group of chain of events that are going to occur because of this sin. So notice that his Hatred, Amnon's hatred of Tamar is greater than the, quote, love, which was lust. So he never really cared about her. He wasn't interested about what was best for her. He just wanted self-gratification. So when we look at uh, verse 6, we see, um, to verse 18, we see that he cast her out and... Um, so she says to him, No, indeed, this evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servant who attended him and said, Here, put this woman out, away from me, and bolt the door behind her. And she had on a robe of many colors, for the king's virgin daughters wore such apparel. And his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. Now he doesn't even say, put my sister or put my brother's sister. Now he's calling her the woman. Put the woman out. My, my, my. My, my. So she then says to him, trying to convince him to change his mind from committing another evil act by shoving her out there. She says, this is worse than what you just did to me. He could have redeemed himself a smidge had he either married her or had he paid the bride price that's mentioned in Exodus 2, verse 16 and 17, or in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 28 and 29. Um, the payment would have compensated, not really, but would have compensated um, for the fact that she was left to get married now because she was no longer a virgin. All right. So, stop the note of many colors. This is significant in the sense that this we would see on the virgin daughters because it's a garment of privilege. And it's a garment of status. So it tells us that this person is a person 
that's not supposed to work not supposed to work that the needs are supposed to be met because she is a person of privilege so she's probably not feeling so privileged right now so um, we know that Tamar deserved better treatment than this as an Israelite as a relative the daughter of the of the king and as her sibling he should have been treating her better he should have been looking out for her and the fact that she was a princess right so she really wasn't treated so princess like so notice then in verse 19 and 20 we see Tamar mourning and her brother Absalom steps up and tries to comfort her then Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her robe of many colors that was on her and laid her hand on her head and went away crying bitterly and Absalom her brother said to her has Amnon your brother been with you but now hold your peace my sister he is your brother do not take this thing to heart so Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house so she put the ashes on her head she tore a robe which all was a symbol of grief as this was a calamity on her and it was a terrible crime that was committed against her she has no fault in this and all of the fault is on Amnon and so she needed not to give voice to shame we know that you know many women who have gone through this that they struggle with shame and they struggle with that voice that tells them that it was their fault and we know this was not her fault um, she did all that she could to uh, convince him otherwise and we see that he took advantage of her and so then we see Absalom ask her hey has Amnon your brother been with you and he immediately knew that Amnon was responsible for her grief and so we see that the blindness of lust convinced him that his actions were right he was totally deceived and after he committed the act then there was a wake-up call and now he's going to try to hide it is that not typical many times that's typical isn't it we commit we commit a sin and then we try to hide it right instead of just going to the base of the cross repenting and then doing penitence for whatever it is if that is required culturally so in 2nd Samuel chapter 13 looking now at verse 21 and 22 we see that David here and he's angered but we see that he doesn't take any action all right but when king david heard all of these things he was very angry and absalom spoke to his brother amnon neither good nor bad for absalom hated amnon because he had forced his sister tamar so we see that he had that king david had a right to be angry and he actually he didn't do anything to protect her you know maybe maybe he tried to convince himself that his son would never do that right maybe and so that's something that we have to ask ourselves do you think that David caught on that this is what was happening there's a lot of common commentaries who actually think that David knew and sent her in I'm not convinced of that I'm not convinced of that I don't see that 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 the scriptures actually say that I think that's something that the commentaries read into it I don't see that you know where it comes out and script says that so as time goes on Absalom has Amnon murdered so the bitterness bitterness happened and so then in verse 23 to 27 we see that Absalom invites all the king's sons to a feast 
And it came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shears in Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim. So Absalom invited all the king's sons. And then Absalom came to the king and said, Kindly note, your servant has sheep shears. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go now, lest we be a burden to you. Then he urged him, but he would not go, and he blessed him. And then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said to him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him. So he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. And so we see that this took place after two years. Two years from the time the incident happened with Tamar to the time we see this festival, this celebration around time to shear the sheep. And so um, it was natural that Absalom would have a great feast and that he would invite all of his brothers over to celebrate. And so we see that, um, you know, Absalom asked David's permission to allow Amnon and all the king's sons to come to the feast. So uh, David gives permission. And so we see in verse 28 and 29 that Absalom has Amnon killed. Now, Absalom had commanded his servant saying, Watch now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not be afraid. I, ha I Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and valiant. So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and each one got on his mule and fled. And so they waited till Amnon was merry with wine. And so we see that Absalom, he not only waited two years until the bitterness festered to have this act completed, but he also planned it out. And you can bet that he planned it out over and over and over. He nursed it and rehearsed it till we get all the details, all the evil details, Set. And so he, they waited to Amnon. His senses were not what they should have been. And so then he gave the order to strike him, and they murdered him. So the servants were obedient. And uh, notice in Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 10, God had promised David that the sword should never depart from your house in judgment of David's sin. And so this is a partial fulfillment of this promise. And so we see that David committed adultery and he committed murder in his heart when he had it set up for Uriah to be murdered at the front of the army. Then in verse 30 to 36, David learns of the murder of his son, his firstborn son. And it came to pass while they were on the way that news came to David saying, Absalom has killed all the king's sons and not one of them is left. So the king arose, tore his garments, and lay on the ground and all his servants stood by with their clothes torn. Then Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, Shemaiah. David's brother answered and said, Let not my lord suppose they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, for only Amnon is dead. For by the command of Absalom this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. Now therefore, let not my lord the king take the thing to his heart to think that all the king's sons are dead, for only Amnon is dead. And then Absalom fled, and the young man who was keeping watch lifted his eyes and looked, and there many people were coming from the road on the hillside behind him. And Jonadab said to the king, Look, the king's sons are coming, as your servant said, so it is. So it was, as soon as he had finished speaking, 
that the king's sons indeed came, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Also the king and all his servants wept very bitterly. And so, initially, he's told that all of his sons have been killed. And then they let him know that, you know what, it's not all of your sons, but it is your eldest, Amnon. And so he grieved and grieved. And so many commentaries remind us that David not only had a role to play as a father in the correction of this adult son, but he, his first initial duty was as king. We all know that as king, they acted as a judge also. So if the court system uh, did not give the answer that the person wanted and they didn't think they had been fairly judged, they could petition the king to hear their uh, their plight. And so David, technically, whether it's a son or one of the people in the community, he's responsible first and foremost as king and judge and then as daddy. And so we see he does we do see as time goes on that Absalom is sent to an exile city or on his own he decides to go to an exile city. So he flees Jeshur. Now remember, who's in Jeshur? Why do you go there? Grandpa. His maternal grandpa is the king, remember, of Jeshur. We see this in Second Samuel chapter thirteen, verse thirty seven to thirty nine. But Absalom fled and went to Talmi, the son of Amahud, king of Jeshur. And David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Jeshur and was there three years. And King David longed to go to Absalom, for he had been comforted concerning Amnon because he was dead. So did he recognize that this son committed a crime, a sin? Yes, he did. But he was ready to forgive him. He loved him. He was his daddy. And Amnon and Absalom were his sons. And so we see that Absalom flees to his grandpa. And remember, he's the king of Jeshur. So this makes for an interesting um, dynamic politically. And so we see after three years, David's coming around and he's kind of longing to be reconciled with his son. And uh, he's thinking about it. He's processing it. So we see that Absalom, he does come back to Jerusalem. Because Joab, the right-hand man of King David, plots. And we're going to read about the plot. There's an elderly lady that helped him. So we're looking at 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. Joab's plan to reconcile David and Absalom. So he knows that the king's heart is concerned about his son Absalom. And so... Um, he finds this really elderly, wise woman, and he, he tells her, you know what? Go before the king, pre, uh, pretend that you're a mourner, and put mourning apparel on, and whatever you do, don't anoint yourself with oil, no perfume, no perfume. Go as though you are in the garb of mourning completely for the dead, and speak to the king about this matter. And then he told her exactly what to say. And so she comes and she tells a story about having one dead son and another son that's been threatened with death. And she goes on down and she's coming to him as though she's asking for help. And so um, her story is believable because she's a widow. And so that invites sympathy. 
Um, she tells him that she lives a distance from Jerusalem, so he's not going to be able to easily check up on what she, her facts and her case. And the fact that she was old, it gives more dignity to her story. And then she has all of the garb on as though she's been mourning. And so he's completely uh, convinced of her story. But he knows that it seems a little too similar. And so it arouses his, his suspicion. And so he starts to question her. And he asked, he asked her, hey, did, uh, did Joab send you? And you know what? She tells him the truth. She doesn't lie. And we can see then that in verse 21 to 24 in chapter 14, Absalom returns to Jerusalem, but he doesn't return to see his So they haven't met up just yet. So let's take a look at verse 21 to 24. And the king said to Joab, All right, I have granted this thing. Go therefore, bring back the young man Absalom. And then Joab fell to the ground on his face and bowed himself and thanked the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord, O king, in that the king has fulfilled the request of his servant. So Joab arose, went to Jeshur, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, Let him return to his own house, but do not let him see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house, but he did not see the king's face. And so he keeps, Absalom keeps thinking, I want to go see my dad, I want to go see my dad, I want to go see my dad. He wants reconciliation, but nothing's happening. So he decides that he's going to call for Joab to come to his house to visit. So he can have a little chit chat about how he needs him to go and to convince his daddy that he wants to come see him. Well, Joab decides that that's probably not a good idea. So he doesn't go. And before you know it, we find that Absalom tells his servants to go out and he says, you know what, uh, Joab has uh, a wheat field next to mine. Go out and start his wheat field on fire. Now, why did he do that? He did that to get Joab's attention. Hey, I called for you and you didn't come. So now I set your field on fire and I bet you come knocking at my door immediately. And guess what? Knock, knock, knock. You bet. There he was. As soon as he found his field on fire, he was a knocking on Absalom's door. And so after that, we see that they have a nice little chat. And then in verse 33, we see that David receives Absalom. So Joab went to the king and told him. And when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. And then the king kissed Absalom. So you can see that David has been put in a precarious situation. He lost one son. He has another son that is guilty of murder. And so, uh, you have to remember that, you know, David did what he did to Uriah. He was forgiven. And so then you have to put all of that through your mind. You know, sometimes the uh, commentaries, they, they have the mindset that, you know what, David should have slayed this son. And, uh, you know, there's, there's that side of the coin, but there's also the side of the coin that, you know what, David committed the same kind of thing where he had someone else murder someone and he was forgiven and given an opportunity. But I'm just going to say this to you. We're running out of time, but I want to encourage you to study uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15 where we actually see Absalom steals the hearts of the men of Israel. So he stands at the gate of the city and when people come who uh, don't feel as though they had a proper judgment in the regular court system and they're coming to the king as a supreme 
judge. Uh, he meets them and he says, hey, why are you here? And they say, well, you know, had this court system and this is what happened. And he said, well, there really isn't anybody to listen. So I wish I was a judge. And so he does all this manipulation to get them to like him. And so he positions himself. He carries and makes himself have the image that he's this humble person, that he is the people's person. Now, let me ask you this. Do we ever see any of that? Do we ever see any of that in our modern culture? Do we ever see politicians who put themselves so that they look as though they are troubled for the people, as though they look as though they have a personal interest, right? They sympathize with the people. Uh, they position themselves so that they don't look like they're attacking the person that's in office, but over here in a nicey, nicey way, they're letting you know that they would do a better job, right? So they are taking you on. And so then it's one of those things where you sit and say to yourself, hmm, he's positioning himself to have an image as the politician would so that he can be put into that ops into that office so we see then in chapter 15 verse 7 through 10 he plans to overthrow David's kingdom right plans to overthrow his kingdom and so he's basically going to be um, committing treason under the guise of worship in this particular chapter verse 7 through 10 and then we see that he's divisive with the people. And eventually it gets to the point where he begins to take over. And 200 men come. And, you know, there's this whole little part of the story. By the end of that chapter, we see that David is on the run with people who were loyal to him. And he leaves the kingship to spare his own life and knows that Absalom's going to come in and take over. So it is a phenomenal story how one person's sin, David originally, his sin, right? Bathsheba, lust, all right? We nailed Uriah, the husband, is called home from war. And he tries to get him to go over to sleep with the wife because he already knows that she's pregnant. And he didn't feel it was right. So then he sends him back to war, puts him on the forefront, the front row. He's killed. And so that was his intention all along so that it wouldn't be noted. So if you get time, that would be a portion to study out. So we see the generational iniquity starting with David and then it comes down in his line remembering that whatever we do in moderation our children will do in excess that includes our blessings our good acts but it also includes our sin and so the sin is where it really gets ugly all right so stop and think when it visits down three and four generations what it looks like that's nasty right so better that we would clean it up so that our children do not repeat that, right? So again, we come back to uh, repentance. Come back to repentance again, noting that there's a good reason to repent. And it's not just for us, it's for our children's sake. For our children's sake. So let's just review. We started out this evening talking about that, you know, sometimes... We don't see with our spiritual eyes. We don't see with our spiritual ears. We're not uh, renewing our mind. So then there's a sin that we know is a sin. We're going to commit it. We're going to look for somebody that's going to agree with us uh, to help us be deceitful and to present it and to convince ourselves that it's A-OK -okay and give us a line and an excuse to we can give to others to present ourselves as though, no, oh, it wasn't a sin. It wasn't a sin because yada, yada, yada. Right? We take that excuse. So, remember that we need to be careful as to where we go for advice. 
and we need to look at the motive of our heart when we go seeking advice you know if you're living a scriptural biblical life you want to have two to three mentors that you can go to maybe that are experts in varying areas of life that you could get some counsel and uh, you know you never want to just go to whoever you always want to know when you're going for advice but of course this is one of those things where he set up he knew that he could get advice from this person advice that he wanted hopefully we're all beyond that point hopefully right but the only way that we get beyond that is to continually renew our mind so that we're continuing to grow so i just want to encourage you you get an opportunity to take and to look at 14 15 16 so that you can just kind of see it all play out and it can be etched on your spirit the importance of one generation to the next generation to the next generation you know your life is not your own your life will impact whoever it's touching now day to day but it's going to impact generations to come and so that's something that we really really need to think about before we say and do some of the things that we say and do all right so let's close with a word of prayer heavenly father again we stand in amazement at some of the things that you can teach us um, that happened thousands of years ago, like in David's life and his son's life and, you know, how that is uh, usable today, thousands of years later. I'm amazed by that, Heavenly Father, and I, I thank you that you took time to lay out some of those stories so that we can learn from these characters about our own character heavenly father we ask it goes on that you would help us to put a spiritual mirror up to take a look at our own character traits and to to have a conversation with you heavenly father as to you know the the character traits that are positive and then those that need to be spit polished a little bit more so, Heavenly Father, we thank you for that time that's up ahead this week that we'll get to spend more time with you in the Word and that you'll give us more clarification. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are Abba Daddy and that you continue to be our Daddy who provides our daily bread each day. We thank you that you look forward to having time with us each day and um, just sitting and communing with us and uh, just listening listening to the good things that happen and listening to some of our concerns that we might have uh, in this precarious season we uh, thank you Heavenly Father that you continue to bless us and prosper us uh, financially and bless us and prosper us uh, in good health and uh, we love you Lord and it is our sincerest desire to honor you and to worship you in all that we say and in your precious name the name of Jesus amen well with that said I have to wish you a blessed week and I'll see you yet again next week happy studying take care now